three. All right. Hey, everybody. This is the Free Will Science and Re Religion podcast. My name is George Ortega. I'm here with Gary Mosher. Um, and basically, we're, we're here to talk about, this is like episode number like 13, 14, 15, I don't know. Uh, we're here to talk about why free will is impossible, why, why science refutes it, why religion refutes it, why basically absolutely nothing in this, in this world that we do is in any fundamental way up to us. All right, Gary, um, all right, I, we can maybe understand how the average person on that on the street hasn't thought about this too much. You know, they're taught as when they're little kids that nothing, that they have a free will and they haven't gotten around to figuring this out. All right, fine, we can understand that. How do you explain academics, Harvard, MIT, Yale, Princeton, these, these top academics that, that don't get this? Because obviously they don't, they don't because like if they did, then I think at least academ academia would be on, on board. Yeah, well, well, I'd say that, you know, I actually did some videos today on physics, and I don't even think the academics in physics get physics, you know what I mean? So they get caught up in stuff, and that's all that, you know, they're, they're almost like religious people. You know, they have their own incentives and their own vision of the world, and they want, like physicists want there to be a magic universe, and they're trying to create one. And I guess, you know, for psychologists, it's all about this human health thing, you know, and some description of what an adjusted mind is and some, you know, and, and so they've kind of lost the idea of finding the truth in human psychology and are really just looking for happy pills, right? I mean, they're kind of driven by the pharmaceutical companies. They're kind of driven by the money, you know, the money talks. And the money is just about psychological health. It isn't about psychological understanding. So, you know what I mean? So there's really a kind of a disconnect between their science and its motives. The science is too focused on making money with their therapy than in making money finding the truth. All right. I could understand that, you know, because you're right. And in so many different ways, uh, academia has to, like, you know, cater to, to the, the vested interests, you know, the pharmaceuticals and all that. But, like, you know, you have this, like, for example, in psychology, you also have this, this um, guiding principle of, of not just human behavior, of behavior of all organisms that we essentially seek pleasure, avoid pain, you know, or that, or that our behavior is a result of nature and nurture. Now, if you want, you know, either one of those explanations of why organisms and humans act the way we do refutes free will. And this isn't difficult to understand. We could also, like, say causality. If everything has a cause, free will is impossible. If you want to try to refute causality with some quantum nonsense and say some things are uncaused, that also refutes free will. How do people, you know, these academics who are supposed to be, you know, objective thinkers not get such simple, strong logic? Well, I guess that's another word you're using, simple. So, yeah, they can't do anything simple, right? Because they have a whole bunch of complex math they learned, and they want to use it, right? And so they have a whole bunch of complex theories and complex machines and complex experiments, and they want all that complexity to come up with a complex answer, not a simple answer. So, they, yeah, they don't want to, you know, concede to it. And I'd say, too, that there's, you know, I think the financing issue is important. So I just think there's... No one's going to finance a philosophy of we're just bugs, right? No one's going to, who's going to finance the, yes, prove human beings are just bugs and, you know, the world's going to love you. Well, no, the world's going to hate you, okay? Well, I mean, you you right. prove that to people and they're just going to throw you out of the building. Gary, I mean, that makes sense and, you know, I, I, that's one kind of like factor that weighs into it. But I've done some research on, like, for example, they did a, um, a survey on sociologists. And, like, basically, like, all the sociologists that they interviewed for this survey believed that they were going to make some, like, world-changing breakthrough in their field. Okay, so these, these guys have huge egos. In other words, you would think that just for the fact, you know, that Searle quote, that, like, John Searle said that for our, for our world to overcome this delusion of free will, it would be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or any of the other great revolutions in human thought. So you would think that at least some of these guys would have the, the kind of like ambition to make their mark on the world, to change the world in this fundamental way. Well, I, I think Sam Harris is an example of a guy who's doing that. And, and I would argue that, like you brought up Dennett before in a previous conversation, and Daniel Dennett is the opposite extreme, right? He's a guy that's basically admitted, you know, right out and open almost, that he's 
contriving arguments because he thinks people can't handle the truth. So it's almost like he's saying, I can't let them know about the UFOs because they'll all panic. And so he actually concedes he doesn't believe in free will, but he doesn't think regular people can know that because if they know it, they can't handle the truth. And I just find that almost hilarious that here's a guy who's calling himself a scientist who's basically admitted, I'm making it up because you can't handle the truth. I mean, that's almost ridiculous, right? Yeah, yeah, and I hear you. And that explains, then there's another guy, Saul Smol Smolansky. He's another one. Like, Dennett is like more of a compatibilist. You know, he'll actually come up with like different definitions of free will to make it, you know, um, valid, whatever. But this guy Smolansky, he understands completely that free will is impossible. Yet his book was about like, yes, but like it's a dangerous belief. You don't want to tell people about it. All right, fine. But well, that explains. I did see Dennett do it, so I'm just saying I actually saw Dennett in a conference, and he, you know, somebody pushed him on the subject, and he actually did admit that, you know, yes, I'm telling people what they need to hear. You know? Gary, Gary, we, we got to get that clip. I mean, I, I think LaFair, you act whatever allows us to, like, you know, use maybe 15 seconds of it or whatever. We should get this on a podcast, absolutely, and just dissect it and just, because I have a lot of, a lot of people, I think, uh, don't get that. A lot of people don't realize that Dennett gets that we don't have a free will. So essentially, he's basically, like, deceiving people, you know, taking this paternalistic attitude toward them, and I think when people understand that, that'll help like sway them away from his position. I think I actually did a video. So, so I think I actually have a video where I actually play his clip and I actually do respond to it. So I mean, I think I actually do have a record of it now. I just got to find it in the 4,000 videos I've done. But um, you know, but that's that's the real thing with scientists, right? Scientists are just humans like me and you, right? They're all corruptible and manipulatable about what book is going to sell. And so that was the argument I was going to bring up is that Dennett can sell a book that gives people, you know, that makes people feel good and has little hearts on it. And you know what I'm saying? It's it's selling people the candy, right? And pe you can sell more candy than you can sell, you know, whatever, lubricating diesel oil or something. You know what I'm saying? It's just people just don't get that the, the valuable stuff, the truth, okay, just isn't as fun. Okay, as the frivolous roller coaster, happy land with all the silly stuff, you know. So the silly, frivolous world wins because people just don't like going into the serious world of where I have to take responsibility and I have to use my brain and that's all work and I don't want to do any work. I just want to do what everybody else is doing. I just want my piece of pie and I don't want to bother earning it. I hear you. Um, all right, there's what I keep on like messing. Sorry, I keep messing with the camera. Um, <laughs> It'll, it's like, uh, all right, anyway, um, there's two movies that I think we need to consider in, in this. Uh, one of them is Inconvenient Truth, and the other is What the Bleep Do We Know? Uh, Inconvenient Truth presented to the world this, like, this, this reality that, that made everybody uncomfortable, like, you know, that people didn't understand it, and, like, it was like, you know, it was like, <laughs> it was... It was like a hammer. It was, you know, it really like, you know, just like phased people. Now, on the other hand, there is this What the Bleep Do We Know, a movie that actually like made people feel good about like, oh my God, quantum mechanics says like we can control our reality and all this stuff that's nonsense. But here's the thing, like, you would have thought that What the Bleep Do We Know would actually have um, done better at the box office. But as it turns out, What the Bleep Do We Know earned about $15 million gross in box office receipts, whereas Inconvenient Truth earned about $50 million. So, like, so yeah, I think, well, like... I was going to argue, though, that Inconvenient Truth had the advantage of Al Gore and a lot of controversy and a lot of press, so I think it got a lot more press, and it just happens to be a fantastic title, right? I mean, it's just the kick-ass title of the century, Inconvenient Truth. I mean, you just can't have a better title, right? I mean, that's just too good. Absolutely, but, like, you know, imagine, like, somebody... I mean, like... All right, here, here's, this is something we're, um, I've been working on. There have got to be like some um, multimillionaires, people, you know, who are uh, worth at least two, three, you know, several hundred million dollars or, or a few billion. Okay, now these people have made their, their money. They've made as much money, more money than they intended to make. So, like, that's something that they, they, don't, they don't need to, like, um, that that's that's something that's an accomplished goal. But these guys have like big egos, and they want to make their mark on the world. So like the idea is like you appeal to one of these guys, you pitch one of these guys, and say, "Listen, 
Um, this guy, John Searle, the 13th most quoted philosopher post-1900 in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, says for our world to under Understand the free will is an illusion would be the biggest revolution in human thought ever, bigger than Einstein and all. All right, you pitch this to one of these guys. Now, a documentary like Inconvenient Truth, it costs, let's say, one, two billion, a million dollars. Um, what the bleep do we know costs about five million. So you have this guy that has hundreds of millions of dollars. Say, listen, you create, you, you invest five million dollars in this film, you get it back, you probably make 10, 20 million from it, and you go down in the history books for like financing the leading of this. The, the human species to a fundamentally new consciousness. How's that sound? Oh, it sounds like a wonderful fairy tale. You know, I was just <laughs> waiting for the three bears, and you know, because obviously, obviously, the, I would argue that people that are really rich have no conscience, and they have no soul, and they're just evil, nasty takers, <laughs> and so they'll never understand the idea of giving anything. So yeah, I, I just I don't think they can understand the the mechanics of it because if they did, they would be riddled with guilt right now. You know, they'd be saying, "Why am I wasting all this money when people are starving? They're actually starving, okay? And I'm wasting money on you know marble toilet seats and shit. You know, so I mean, th they already have to have a pretty blind eye, you know, to to live as a rich man. You have to be you have to be a pretty cold hearted SOB. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I agree. I agree, Gary. But that's why this appeal isn't to, like, in other words, like, one appeal could be, like, for example, the, the, like, this free will belief is cl causing climate change denial, you know, because, it's like, scientists are telling people, you're destroying civilization, and people can't hear that, so their unconscious makes them deny that climate change is happening. So, like, you know, these, I, I recognize how these multimillionaires and billionaires wouldn't, you know, really find that pitch convincing, but this is a pitch for themselves, this is a pitch for their egos, this is a pitch that like, you create this movie and tell people like something they don't want to hear, nobody wants to hear this, but it's the truth, and you got, you, you know, all of a sudden, I you know, understand, but I'm just saying, they could also just buy Survivor stock, or they could buy American Idol, and so yeah, they'll, they'll just figure, I can sell schlock and make even more money, so I, I just mean that, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you that if, if, they had a, if I had money, Right, I'd be using it to change the world. I wouldn't be marble in my toilet seat. So I get you. I'm just saying the reason why they don't get it is because they're not they're them and they're not me. <laughs> you know, uh, you know. Um, but but I mean, it's, it's an interesting the whole um, you know what what is the like for me the, the what free will does it leads to logic. So that's that's where you know I might disagree with Searle that the you know, free, not recognizing, recognizing you don't have a free will is important. I'm not saying it's not important, okay? I'm just saying it's important because it's a fundamental step to realizing that the whole game is a logic game, that we really are here to obey the evidence, okay? We're, and it's just totally illogical not to. And this idea of a free something gives you a, a independence from even logic. And I'm saying, no, logic is the game. The evidence is the game. And, uh, you know, the, the, the integrity of arguments is the game, you know, and you just can't play with this, you know, made up religion crap and all these other fairy tales. Like you mentioned, the quantum, you know, it's it's just weak. Okay, evidentially, it's weak, and they're they're selling it like it's the strongest truth in the universe, and it's the weakest truth in physics. All right. Well, all right. So so like we were talking before about like the psychologists aren't going to get this because they want to paint kind of like a a picture of like a a well-adjusted person, and, and the physicists don't get this because they really don't understand what they're studying. They might be able to remember it and implement it, but they have no, they're clueless. So, like, basically, what discipline in academia, because I, you know, I think Darwin, for example, when Darwin you know, proposed evolution, I don't think he proposed it to the, to the average guy, you know, like, I think he initially, he got his colleagues in, 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 um, what was his field? I don't even know what his field was. But anyway, he got the that's, that's, he was a naturalist. But but you know, Darwin is a good case study of you know how things get kind of distorted because it was Darwin's grandfather who believed in evolution, right? So Darwin's grandfather was a huge advocate for evolution. He just didn't have the evidence, right? And so what happened is the grandson essentially found the evidence. You know, so Darwin wasn't even convinced of evolution. He just thought it's a wacky theory my grandfather has. And then he gets to the Galapagos, and all of a sudden he's saying, "Hey, maybe Gramps was right, and this all looks like uh, you know it's pointing in this direction that yeah, this is where we were a million years ago, you know." And so that's sort of an irony that Darwin didn't really make the theory of evolution. What he did was compile the argument, a decisive slam dunk argument, 
And that's where I'm back to logic again. You know, he gave you the reason to believe it. You know what I mean? He gave you the evidence to believe it. Well, yeah, all right, so then we got to understand, so, like, how was he able to succeed? Because, like, evolution, I mean, like, it may be a very solid argument, but it's not a simple argument. In other words, like, it's, there's complexities, there's genetics, there's, like, Mendel's P's and all that stuff. But, like, with, with cause and with free will, you know, causality well, so that's, refutes that's, it. That's exactly what I'm getting to. We, me and you, don't even need much evidence, right? I just need a speck of evidence for free will because I already see it in myself. You know what I'm saying? I don't even need to go to a book or a scientist or I don't need any facts and figures to be able to deduce when I was 10 years old that the shit, any shitty shit I do is shit inside of me. You know what I mean? Any good stuff I do is good stuff inside of me and that, that's all it is. I don't magically go to the universe and say, make me do something. I go right inside my eyeballs and say, what did I just do and why did I do it? And I knew it. There was, a, there was an answer. You know what I mean? I knew there wasn't no mystery. It was, it was a reason I did it, and it was a calculated reason, and so I didn't need much evidence, right? I didn't need much philosophical theory to understand the concept that I was a machine. I knew at 11 years old, I was a machine. And that's what I'm saying. An 11-year-old can understand this. In other words, like, you know, basically, like, our understanding is everything has a cause. You ask pretty much anyone, you know, like, especially non-scientists, does everything have a cause? And, you know, because I've asked this, I've... I've I've led like dozens of, of meetups in Manhattan, and you people come and you know you ask them this question. And they say yes, everything has a cause. Everything has a cause. You know, you make a decision; it's going to have a cause, and there's going to be a cause to that cause, and a cause to that cause, and a cause to that cause, and these causes regress back to before you were born, and that's why free will is impossible. They don't get this. You know, are fine. I can understand how like you know the layperson may not get this. I, I don't understand it, but like. You know, again, my question is like, if, if psychologists have like kind of like this motivated reasoning not to get this, if philosophers, philosophers, I don't think they they, they just don't know how to think. I, I don't know, I don't know what their problems. My question well, is, I, like, I, I what that they're getting there though. Okay, I'd say like people like Sam Harris do give you some hope. Okay, because Sam Harris is a pretty thoughtful thinker on all these subjects. He's, you know, even when he's even when I think he's wrong, you know what I'm saying? He's not making garbage arguments. He's making pretty thoughtful arguments to take a lot of, it takes a lot of work to unravel them, so to speak. You know what I mean? It's not a simple failure, it's a complex failure. You know, it's a, it's a failure in complexity, not a failure in some simple idea, where I'd say a lot of these guys are just failing simply, like Dennett's assumption that we can't live without God, essentially. Right? We can live without God, trust me. Yeah. You know, and and and, and so, so it's that kind of thing. I think a lot of these scientists are just kind of stuck in like, and like I say, they're just too academic too. You know what I mean? They're just too specialized, so they don't think it's the forest and the trees, right? They know the trees, but they don't understand the forest at all. You know, they got no clue when it comes to forest. Yeah, and if, if they're going to like understand or not based on like various no motivations, this belief in God I think has to count among one of the biggest because like basically most people believe in God, like, you know, like here in the United States, 80-90% believe in a higher power or whatever, and they tend to believe that this higher power is good. Now, one of the challenges to getting the world to understand that we don't have a free will is, like, the, the, the evident reality, the implication that if, like, if what we do isn't up to us, then, like, if you want to believe in God, then you have to believe that God is both good and evil, that any kind of atrocity, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Stalin, any, like, you know, any any kind of like genocide, you have to blame God for it, and that's that's a huge problem for people. Yeah, well, I was just thinking of symphony orchestra, right? It just popped into my head as as a, a reaction to what you were saying in a funny way, in the sense that you know you're here, you're talking about this 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 filtering kind of thing, right? And you're saying, well, how does the symphony play? It doesn't play by willing it, right? It plays because cause and effect. Every one of these bi violin strokes had to be practiced over and over and over again. The timing, the, the the you know, it's a complex juggling act, you know, that each one of those players is doing, and it's only possible because they learned how to do it. it it's not possible because they willed the symphony into creation. The conductor doesn't will the symphony to play well. They either play well or they don't, <laughs> you know, and it's not going to be about what he's willing. Gary, that's a great analogy for how our brain works. In other words, like there's not a, a humunculus, a, a we inside our brain that's like, you know, 
that's in other words like our brain is is comprised of like you know the the the, the trumpets and the clar the the percussion the violins all this stuff that you know they're competing I mean I guess like with the, the symphony they work together and all but that's that's a perfect you know kind of like explanation of, of why we don't have a free will all this stuff is happening and so there is no we there's no like there's no part of our brain that we could you know designate as as like well actually ac we got to think about this actually it's like is there like well, the conductor doesn't really like determine you know what the musicians play in a symphony yeah, but yeah, yeah, well, the, I would the say score the is the, 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 the hypothalamus is sort of like the filing cabinet of your brain so I would sort of argue it is in the middle and it's the filing cabinet, you know, it's the thing that goes when you have Alzheimer's, you know, where you start losing the connections. So I would argue that I think it's probably has something to do with all the crap coming in and it decides what crap's going to go out. So, you know, that would be my deduction, you know, in a, in a sketch, you know, I'm doing a sketch of the brain and that would be my sketch drawing is that's where the consciousness really happens is right there in the middle. But that's just, a, it's very convenient and very intuitive, but I don't know if it's factual at all, but I'm just saying it, it, it's intriguing in terms of this idea of a filing cabinet and the stuff goes in and it gets filtered and gets ordered, gets put in the right A slot or the B slot or the C slot and that's how this processing begins is putting things in the proper slot and then just weighing them. You know, what's in slot A, what's in slot B, this is the decision based on how much weight is in there. But I like the, you know, the symphony thing for a lot of reasons but yeah, I always think of it as like to be a really good person, yeah, you have to start running on all cylinders, that kind of argument, right? I mean, you you, you got to have your emotions in control, and you got to have your selfishness in control. <laughs> you have to have your plan, you know, just to keep yourself happy enough to live. You know what I mean? Being a worker, being a good janitor is how I put it. That the ideal human is this perfect janitor. He just shows up and fixes stuff. You know, he just cleans up and fixes. And that, to me, is like the ideal description of what a great human being would be: is somebody who just, you know, compromises his own self a little bit but creates so much comfort, you know what I mean, that he's a huge winner in the end because he left the world so much better than he got it. And that's the win. I mean, we got to be thinking like share owners in a, in a condo. We got to be thinking about leaving the place better than we got it. That's the theory of life that wins. I agree. And I think what the reason it's difficult for us is because, like, let's say, a thousand, two thousand years ago, that wasn't in the mindset of people. People didn't have like a, a mass media that that ha let them know that like a billion people are living under you know a dollar a day, and that like you know um, ten million kids under age of five are dying every year of malnutrition and all that. So people didn't. So like we we have access to a lot more knowledge, and people aren't you know we're not. It's so not like we're not. The luxury of time to think too, right? I mean, I don't have to go out and chase down some food. I don't have to go pick berries all day. I don't have to, you know what I mean? I don't have the labors of a brutal life, you know, the fetters of a brutal life to keep me swatting those bugs all the time, you know what I mean? So I have time to be a little reflective and think about what I'm doing um, where, yeah, people thousands of years ago didn't really, weren't given much opportunity to think about living. They had to do it, you know? They, had, they were busy living. They didn't have time to think about living. I hear you. So, like, I think the ideal, you're right. You're completely right. The ideal is for people to, like, to think about this, get it right, promote it, because it's the right thing to do, because it, it would help the world. It would help the world evolve to a to more intelligent world. But but we have to acknowledge that people are not like that. People, you know, people are, like, you know, motivated too much by self-interest, but, you know, we can use that. In other words, like in terms of happiness, you were talking about happiness before. One of the four personality traits that's most correlated with happiness is self-esteem. Okay, so like self-esteem is basically an evaluation of ourselves. Like what happens with the free will belief, you know, we're human beings. We make mistakes all the time. We screw up all the time. We do things that are wrong all the time. When we believe that we have a free will, we're blaming ourselves. Each time we blame ourselves, our self-esteem erodes. So in other words, like, we want to yeah, make a happy I've world. Been that, I've been running from that my whole life, and I say it's the greatest. I, I think that is my greatest asset. My greatest asset is the fact that I hate my guts. I love the <laughs> fact that I hate my guts. Okay, because that keeps me trying, baby. That keeps me trying to do better. That keeps me struggling for the gold medal. Okay, I I consider myself a colossal failure, and that keeps me in the game because I want to win and I'm failing, and so I'm fighting for it. And I think that's important. You, you gotta want it. You gotta want it, and you gotta fight for it. And and so yeah, it keeps me in the game. So I want other people to feel that. I want them to feel the energy of being desperate to play a better note. 
I want to play a better note. I want to be a better symphony. I right now I sound like crap and I suck and so I want to do better and the only way I want to be better is I have to think better to do better. All right, I, I have a different take. On, uh, like, for example, like, I attribute that to the world. I used to think that the world was pretty smart and pretty good. Okay, so I learned a bit about like, this free will stuff. I learned the world doesn't get it. I have to conclude that they're not really that smart. Then like, I learned the, like, about how we treat animals, farm animals, lab animals, and how we treat like, the poor in the world. And I have to conclude that the world isn't all that good, that people are just like, not very moral. So like, in other words, like, for my personal happiness, I like to like people, right? Under this free will delusion, I would have to blame them. I would have to condemn them. I would have to like vilify them. I couldn't respect anyone in this free will uh, delusion. So like, basically, it's a gift to me because like, I say to myself, wait a minute, I can't judge them. It would be completely illogical, unintelligent for me to judge these, these horrible, you know, completely stupid people. Oh, it helps me. It makes me happier. Yeah, no, it's like it's telling. It's like saying to me somehow I got to be sympathetic for my toaster or something. If my toast don't make toast, I throw it in the garbage. I don't. I don't say, "Oh, I'm sorry, you're having a bad day and you can't make toast today." No, I just kick it. I say, "You're a piece of garbage." Okay, and I'm not saying we should kick people. I'm just saying I don't have to respect their flaws. I don't have to respect the fact that they're lousy robots, and that's what I consider them. I, I consider them lousy machines that are making too much pollution. They're they're making too much noise. They're sloppy, dysfunctional pieces of crap, and I'm going to call them that. I'm not going to say, gee, I want to be your friend and you're just such a super person. No, I'm going to say, you're a piece of crap, I'm a piece of crap, I'm going to try to be a better piece of crap than you, so try to be better than me. All right, Gary, I agree with you. I think you have to be direct. You have to, like, with climate change, you have to confront people say listen you what we're doing is horrible but from psychology I know that like you know you have to kind of like make your message somewhat like acceptable in other words like, if you tell people stuff like that they go into denial they can't hear it they won't hear it but if you tell them listen you're a piece of crap but don't blame yourself because it's not your fault you know it's in your genes or in yeah. your upbringing maybe like they can accept your message better I'll, I'll give them the right to be a jerk if they admit they're a jerk first okay I'll, I'll give you full jerk rights just admit that you're a jerk okay don't lie to me don't pretend you're you know you're you're a taker you're a pac-man don't pretend you're giving the world a gift by Pac-Manning the pieces out of it. So yeah, don't don't lie to me that you're a great asset to the human race when you know you're just a consuming maggot. So I admit you're a consuming maggot. Admit you got to do better. And I don't even care if you don't do better. I'm just saying admit that you need to do better. If you don't think you need to do better, if you don't think the world needs to be better, you fail colossally by my definition. That is the most colossal error you can make is not to recognize Houston, we got a problem, damn it, and we got to do something about it. I hear. Well, actually, Gary, according to that perspective, I think Christians would be a good sell for that approach because, like, you know, the Christian philosophy of human beings is like we're quote unquote miserable sinners. You know, this original sin, we're just like we're we're you know that's why we need whatever we need with Jesus and all that stuff. You know, so I think that's that's an audience. But God was still saying we deserved heaven just for barely being decent. You know what I'm saying? You didn't have to be a very good person to get into heaven. You just had to not kill stuff, not rape. Well, you could get away with some rape, right? I mean, I mean, what was as allowed you, in the Bible? You, it's a pretty, yeah, a pretty miserable, a pretty miserable human being that's allowed into heaven, right? I mean, all you got to do is say a few things on your deathbed, and it's all okay, right? Now. No, 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 no harm, no foul. You know, you said the magic words, voodoo, poodoo, and you get in. I mean, that's kind of a, you know, I'm just saying that the Christian expectation of good character, that's again so bad. It's such a fail that I'm just like, come on, if that's if that's your definition of a good person, you're not even coming close, fellas. No, I hear you. I mean, they condone slavery. I know, I know. Um, but you know, right? So like, you know, one of one of the things we have to um, approach is this, this, this you know, the, the Christian need to kind of like believe in God and all that stuff and like this, you know, but we we basically have to find a message that's going to like get them to like say, listen, you know, you can hold on to your beliefs, these, these fannies and all, or you can, you know, and if you do that, the world is going to collapse with climate change and all, or you can outgrow that stuff, overcome it through logic and understand the truth of, of what the world is about and then maybe with our kids and, and the future has a chance. Yeah, no, but it's all that understanding word, and I, you know, part of the understanding is understanding how you understand, and you don't get to understand for free. You can't understand evolution by not reading the book, 
Okay, you can't understand, you know, psychology without doing a little bit of research, a little bit of reading and writing and all that kind of, you know what I'm saying? It's like people want it too easy. And full understanding is not going to be that easy. Okay, it's a simple diagram, life on Earth, right? This, this biological mechanism, this reproducing molecule. But the dynamics are subtly different. Like we could talk about reproduction, the fact that whether, what do we desire? Do we desire to have kids or do we desire to have sex? And you know, I would argue, obviously, we desire to have sex, and the kids is just an accident of the, 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 the activity. You know, but that's one of these things. That can be a complex subject to somebody. I would say the dynamic is simple, but the psychology is complex. And I hear you, Gary. Don't, don't want to do the work. I hear you, Gary. We're out of time. This has been a great show. I think next time we talk, let's let's focus on this causality f factor. We're like basically, if causality was made free will impossible, and if logic is going to be our tool to help the world understand this, we've got to get get them to understand causality. To understand uh, the the eddy in the stream, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, okay, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Good show. Uh,